my brother out of jail? I want answers! Alrighty then. I had anticipated that I would have all this time to, you know, prep my episode and I was gonna like write out storyboards for every scene and be totally prepared. No, I was working on episode 212. So yeah, there was that. At the same time, what I found it, as I was directing the episode was for an episodic director coming in to direct a show, the question they're always asking is, are they going to use this shot or not? Well, in my case, I am them. Like, I know if I'm going to use this shot. And like, I know if I like it, I know if I don't like it. So it allowed for a certain amount of speed because I'm the guy that ultimately gets to decide what goes in and what comes out. Also, I think in talking to the, the actors by virtue of the fact that I have a lot of history with them, there's not a lot of static in that channel. Who was that? Those are my new partners, a couple of ex-Delta Force boys I know. Real heavy badasses. What are you talking about? Nothing gets between me and the deal. Jeffrey, at this point, knows the character enormously well. You're not going to Jeffrey and saying, be more excited here. You know, you're not giving him that kind of direction. I was able to guide their performances because I could say, okay, remember two episodes back when you did this, right? This is an echo of that, and four episodes from now, this is where it's gonna land. And what was nice about that was it gave them a lot of freedom to bring their ideas and know that they were doing something that was gonna pay off later. Also, since uh, this particular episode was the anti-episode, it's the episode where at the end of the third act, like, Michael does not have an answer to how we are going to deal with this problem. Sorry, she was talking. I just kept thinking about Jack and I, I, I couldn't help it's it. It's not your fault. I was talking to, uh, to Gabrielle and, and Jeff about the scene where they come home and Michael sends Fiona away at the bottom of the stairs. Fiona knows this is the point in an episode of Burn Notice where we come home and then we go upstairs and make plans, right? So we're not finding her then? <sighs> not that way, Mike. But Michael doesn't do that. He walks over to the counter and then he walks right back out. Where are you going? I'm gonna get the money. Wait, what are you talking about? And so it's deeply upsetting to Sam that we're not doing things the way we're supposed to do things. So I said, the minute he walks away from that counter, you know something's really wrong. And so all through the episode, uh, I was able to talk through uh, these ideas. Another example would be when Gabrielle decks Rachel. You're supposed to smile at the bad guy and make better friends with the bad guy. But this is the episode where she can't control herself. And so she decks the woman. It was a great thing that I could be there to direct it because it was the topsy-turvy episode in a lot of ways. But there are certain things that are easier as the director. Like, there are no surprises when I come to the editing room. I know exactly what I had. And so since I'm responsible for that end of the process as well, certain things were much easier about it. Thing that you do storyboards for on Burn Notice largely is, if it rains, do you know the exact shots that you need so that you don't need to shoot a lot in order to get the scene? In the entire process of directing this episode, that was actually the most intimidating point. I had so many other demands on my time. I had written the script and I knew that I needed to do this, I needed to do storyboards because I was guiding the second unit director who was working on the, the car crash stuff at the beginning. As it happened, it did rain. And the fact that I had a good sense for what exact shots I needed meant that I didn't need to shoot a lot of extra stuff, a lot of just in case stuff because I'd actually thought through the scene and where were people gonna be. It was a valuable process, if a little scary. We always joke that uh, that most bad guys on Burn Notice really like modern architecture and good guys like bungalow architecture. So Rachel's house, we want the idea that she's sort of ruthless and cold and 
that she's done very well, that she's done this to a lot of people, that she, you know, so we needed someplace swanky and that house was just beautiful. For Kenny, it was actually fairly specific. We needed a place where Michael and Kenny could have a conversation where you could see Jack, but Jack wasn't part of the conversation because I didn't want them talking about Jack's problems in front of Jack. And so when we found that location that had a glassed in Miami room that you could see into from the living room, it just gave us the best of both worlds. <laughs> I have to say, like, the work of our, our production designers and our entire art department, it's, it's the thing that I never get over on the show. For now, I'm still like a kid in a candy store. Like, I show up and they built a set, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a, look, it's a medical clinic. How did you build a medical clinic? That's amazing. The Women's Club, I actually wrote that for just an abandoned building, an office building. I knew it was a kicking out the window stunt. My original vision of it had been a building with balconies and one of our production designers, uh, Craig Siebels, who I've, I've known for a long time, can kind of see through my writing to what I actually want, what I actually cared about. So the minute I arrived in Miami, Craig said, all right, so when you said office building, what you meant was women's club. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, oh, I know so. And we went to the women's club and I walked in and I said, right you are, Craig Siebels. Women's club was exactly what I meant. So the scene would be, you know, Sam is listening over there. We just got some information. If, if that's the Waldorf area, Sam's listening over there. Well, it was a great looking location. Uh, we could sell that it was sufficiently isolated that you, we could do the stuff that we needed to do there. It looked a little bit run down. It had a place for us to toss the bad guys and lock them in. Uh, it had fantastic windows. My only concern going there, and this is, you know, when you're shooting a show in seven days and you don't have a whole lot of time to do stuff, this is just the kind of thing where you have to roll the dice and hope for the best. The camera would come this way. They can see you come out and jump in. That'd be really sexy. You sort of write to a particular idea of a scene and then massage back and forth with the location. And so just by virtue of the fact that uh, when I go to Miami and when all the writers go to Miami, we live at the Mutiny, I knew that pool area. I said to our production design team, can you make it look like one of the classic Miami um, areas? Um, and then I talked to the DP about, can we sell this as a larger area than it is? Because it's, it's a rather small pool area, but it doesn't appear that way. The idea there was, we needed a place that sold um, the idea that Rachel is wealthy and she hangs out in swanky places. At the same time, they were having a conversation about bad guy stuff in a hot tub. So it needed to have a feeling that that hot tub was private enough that you weren't having conversations immediately next to a bunch of tourists. So uh, there were a lot of demands, and we were just lucky that we found it at the Mutiny, which, you know, we all knew so well. You got a tracker on you? Always be prepared, Navy SEAL motto. That's Boy Scouts. Mike, you gonna argue with the man who just planted a tracker on your handler? Sam, I could kiss you. Get in line. Got a call from a friend of mine who I went to high school with who said, hey, I saw your show. It sounds like talking to you for 42 minutes. I have a very dry sense of humor, um, and the show reflects that. Get my brother out of jail. We can do that. He'll be released after his arraignment on Thursday. Is that all? Because I have some place to go. My goal is everything works as story. Everything works as drama. Everything is what it is, right? And if you find it funny, terrific. If you don't find it funny, hopefully you find it exciting or dramatic. Can I get that as a guarantee? Can you put that in writing? Great example would be Fiona and Jack um, like playing with army men. I think it's funny that Fiona starts describing the specific capabilities of the weapons that the army men are holding, right? But my goal in writing that scene was that, like, hopefully you'll find it funny, but if you don't find it funny, it's a pretty sweet scene. My guy has an M2 Browning 50 caliber. 
it's a belt-fed weapon, so it's big and hard to hide, but it's got good range. If you don't find it sweet, hopefully you'll find it dramatic because she's actually kind of struggling with how to relate to this kid and she finds a way to do it. Hey, you wanna play Army Man? Okay. In casting the role of Jack, uh, we actually saw that some great kids in Miami and I realized in doing the auditions at the age of five or six, you're not talking about kids with a lot of experience. They're just kids. And so really what it comes down to is the amount of rapport that you have with a kid. So I, I kind of took a hard look at it and talked to my wife about it and I, I just decided, you know, some of these kids are really good, but the kid that I have the best rapport with is my son. I need to find some place to put Jack. I know someone who can do this. There's a writer on the show, Rashad Raisani, who came up with this idea of Fiona not knowing how to relate to the kid. Michael, what am I supposed to do here exactly? And then they blow things up with, they blow up some army men with M80s. Your guy has a Mark II pineapple fragmentation grenade. It was a great dynamic and was a really valuable moment. And just as a father, I'm obviously nervous as hell. And ultimately, as much as I care about the episode, I'm also really worried about my son and how's he gonna relate to the thing daddy does and, and that kind of thing. So it was, a, it was a real risk casting him. Is Jeff Gardenman gonna be in every show? It was really nice just seeing the two of them relate and seeing them hang out and she really took care of him. And, and uh, so that was, so the, we were, it, was, it was a lucky, a, a lucky, uh, coming together of the actress Gabrielle and the character Fiona. Time for you to shuffle off to Buffalo, Lair. Shuffle off to Buffalo and never come back. One of the things that I really, that I care about in the show and that I think people respond to and like is that it's a newer take on an old fashioned show. We have a sort of contemporary editing style and we're more aggressive in our use of the voiceovers, and there are a lot of things that you can point to about the show that are very contemporary, and we're saving people that you want to see saved from circumstances where they're really in jeopardy. He's got an idea, see? I knew it, I knew he'd come through. He hits me in the mouth a couple times, and he gets an idea. Now that we sort of know, what is a, what is a basic episode of Burn Notice? What is a flipped on its head episode of Burn Notice? I think in, one of the things we're really excited about in season three is, now we kind of know even more about how an episode can work and it gives us the opportunity to flip more things on their heads and turn more things around and have whole new approaches, whole new ways of solving problems. Uh, because we always wanna stay in the realm of how does a spy solve your problem? What we're going to do is, is changing up the nature of Michael's relationship to his burn notice. How can we continue those burn notice stories? How can we continue seeing Michael's life as a spy continuing in some sense, but making it about something other than the same search? For season three, we want to do something new. And so uh, that's the plan there.